Hi, this is Paul. ContraPoints came out with a video. YouTube put it front and center for me this morning. The algorithm knowing that I've been putting out videos about the algorithm knowing. What does that mean? Um, the algorithm selecting that I've been putting out videos about J.K. Rowling's, the witch trials of J.K. Rowling's. ContraPoints was uh, in, that con in that podcast in Chapter 6, Natalie and Noah, and ContraPoints has some second thoughts. The ContraPoints begins the conversation in sort of a similar way to what Megan Phelps Roper did. Megan Phelps Roper, to Sam Harris's surprise, sort of begins with the Christian pushback on Harry Potter in the 90s, and then Sam Harris and his interview with Megan Phelps Roper and treatment of the podcast really admonishes his people to push back um, on to push beyond episode number two and get to the big stuff in three and and the rest of them and and it was quite interesting to me when I listened to chapter six how contrapoints was seemed quite conciliar apparently um, ContraPoints is no longer feeling anywhere near as conciliar as when the podcast was recorded. And so it begins with Anita Bryant and some history there. And for some of you, you might not remember that history. Older people might remember that history a little bit better. Basically, the end of it is Anita Bryant is a bigot. And the, the word bigot sort of runs through the whole thing. A number of things struck me about this video. Number one, bigot has pretty much become equal to sinner in ContraPoint's worldview. There's really no exploration for, for being a philosophy channel fundamentally, one which is sort of ad hoc and shtick. For being a philosophy channel, there's really no engagement into any of the deeper issues, such as the source of transgenderism or bigotry. One would imagine that if bigotry is in fact the big enemy, and there's a fair amount of skepticism as to whether bigotry could be addressed finally, well then... Um, what is one to do about bigotry? Now, to jump all the way to the end, the answer the answer about bigotry is basically blocking because bigots are, in fact, uh, people have bigotry to a degree that is irredeemable. Oh, gosh, well, let's just do this. Let's see how this goes. Bigotry is irredeemable and it and people wind up in sort of a spiral. So here's the conclusion. So... I would advise trans people and our allies to keep in mind that J.K. Rowling is not the final boss of transphobia. And for old people like me, final boss is a game reference, the big, the big monster that you defeat at the end and therefore win the game. She's not our devil. The devil is the Republican Party, the conservative party. The it's a pure political filter that remains. The devil is patriarchy. It's the right-wing men who will be the ones to put gender-critical theory into brutal practice. Anita Bryant, Posey Parker, and J.K. Rowling are, to borrow a term from TERFs, handmaidens. TERFs are the real handmaidens. They're useful idiots who put a concerned female face on the patriarchal violence against trans people that will ultimately be enacted by right-wing men. And... So, again, no surprise there, but then what to do about the what to do about the bigots because that's one of the chief concern. Well, Anita Bryant is a bigot. Joe Rowling is a bigot. All uh, Ben Shapiro makes an appearance here. He's a bigot. She's not quite sure how to deal with Dave Rubin. Um, all these people make their way into the video. I know I'm right. As long as he stays here, in the bottom of the whirlpool, he never has to face that he's ruined his relationships and wasted years of life because he just couldn't let it go. And if Now, she, now she tells the story of, of a guy who... A guy who basically destroyed his life making this one issue 
everything. And he lost his marriage and he lost his job. But And she's right here about the psychological dynamic. You can, it's called idolatry. You can make something the center of your life and have it whirl around it and then complain that, well, J.K. Rowling is in danger of doing the same thing. If J.K. Rowling doesn't log off soon, this will likely be her fate as well. I guess what I'm really trying to say is, Harry Potter is dead to me. I'm switching to Twilight. And basically earlier, just block her. Just block J.K. Rowling, and that will then conclude it. The main thrust is political. But I think there's a lot more in the video, video actually that's worth thinking about. One of the issues that arises in this video is the whole winsome war question, which is something that's being fought pretty fiercely in evangelical circles. And this is where Megan Phelps Roper comes into the mix because, well, we'll dive into a little bit more of the the question about, okay, what, ex what exactly is a bigot? Where do they come from? Right now, a, a popular meme on one side is said, it says something like, hate, hate is not natural to people, it's learned. Hence the idea that, well, what we have to do is make sure that no one is educated into hate by their bigoted family, and therefore bigotry can be cut off if we take children and either you know, separate them from their hateful parents or make them, um, you know, educate them in school so that they don't hate. Five. Chapter five, debate. Sar, I know I did this look before and it's like not related to the video topic at all, but it just makes me feel sliving. The boy who slived. So Megan Phelps Roper- And if you've ever listened to any ContraPoints, this is, this is the, this is the shtick. Viewpoint seems to be that scorn and condemnation are never appropriate. That we should approach every conflict with empathy and compassion, even when dealing with the worst, most destructive people in the world. Hi, my name is Megan, and my heretical belief is that even the people who seem to be the worst, most destructive people in the world are human beings who deserve compassion and empathy. If we now, Tom Holland would argue that she got this idea from her Christianity, which I think she would heartily agree. Now, in the Sam Harris conversation, who was it in the Sam Harris conversation? Or was it in the podcast? No, it was in the Oxford, it was in the Oxford Union interview. She basically said, well, she no longer has any religious, no longer holds to any religious beliefs. She just basically uses literature. We want to find a way to change their minds. In her book, in her TED talk, in her public appearances, Megan expresses the idea that society has recently become polarized in some unprecedented way, that we've all become extremists. That in part, part of the benefit for both the podcast and what ContraPoints does in going through the Anita Bryant, and then actually in this, in this second section, she sort of walks through well, the, the witch trial of Anita Bryant. Um, you know, it's it's really rather well done. Um, she she's got a lot of followers for a reason. Unprecedented way that we've all become extremists. That in some sense we've all become the Westboro Baptist Church. I can't help but see in our public discourse so many of the same destructive impulses that ruled my former church. She identifies things like certainty, vilification of compromise, us versus them thinking, suppression. And now if you listen to that list, basically what's happening is that the evangelical winsome war, she's going through the list that the antith, I call it winsome versus antithesis. Antithesis is black, white, light, and dark. This is the, this is basically where the evangelical winsome war is being fought of empathy and celebration of death and misfortune as Westboro-like elements in public discourse. And this really bothers Megan because she claims that a decade ago, when she went on Twitter to tweet about how f 
marriage is abominable to God, it was people who engaged her in a civil, rational way that eventually led her to renouncing Westboro's ideology. Now, it's interesting that she mentions rational here, because if you watch the whole video, one of the things that comes that comes out is that she remains a devotee of the temple of rationalism, but she doesn't have any underpinnings for what transgenderism actually is or where it comes from. Is it a secret, sacred self that is somehow being manifest in a person? The big debate, of course, is, is normality or is, is, is it a pathology? Is it a normality? Um, what exactly what exactly is happening with this but bigotry also sort of is sort of a mystery where does bigotry come from is it a rousseauian virus that has been passed down from generation to generation like i don't entirely disagree with megan about this she's totally right that if you want to change people's minds then approaching them with compassion and empathy is usually the best way to do that but megan re but that's if you care about individuals. But what, again, is the main thing really about? Which is another conclusion that I don't agree with, which is that because compassion and civil conversation are most likely to persuade people, we should never cancel anyone, even the most horrible bigots. And canceling is a pretty meaningless term at this point. But what Megan means is we shouldn't say mean things to bigots. We shouldn't boycott or counter protest or raise our voices. We shouldn't shun or exclude anyone because that- Now, she just mentioned that, well, if you want to actually convince people, that's a bad strategy. But at the same time, we shouldn't take these practices off the table and you might say, well, okay, if the strategy is a bad one in terms of convincing so-called bigots to not be bigoted anymore, and she will basically say that that's a lost cause in many cases. On the other hand, um, what then are those strategies useful for? Those strategies are useful for winning the political outcome. That's just not how you change minds. And I get why Megan thinks this, right? De-radicalization was a really important part of her life experience. She's also clearly holding out hope that other members of her family will leave Westboro and have a life on the outside. She has a quote from her mom in her Twitter bio. The last lines of her book address her family. I want to tell them that I love them. I'll just have to find another way. This in other words, she either loves the wrong people, meaning bigots, or she loves to thoroughly or she's basically too optimistic about human nature. This is touching and human and also kind of a conflict of interest. The problem is Megan's views about this only make sense if you assume that Megan is the main character of reality. If you assume that the moral improvement of bigots is more important than protecting the people they target. Ah, so, and this is something that runs through all of these questions, including J.K. Rowling's position in the podcast, is choosing what to do with people who disagree but have to share the same space? How do people come to agreement or at least compromise with respect to ideas, contrary ideas, warring ideas? What are you to do with the people you disagree with? Or if you assume that changing bigots' minds is the only way to make social progress, which it isn't. As far as I know, Anita Bryant- Now, of course, social, social well, we'll let her finish. ...is 83 years old, and she's still homophobic. But even without Anita's blessing, gay rights have still somehow managed to progress since the 1970s. Okay, so there's a, there's, now we're getting back into this arena. There's been changes in the rules of the arena, and she labels those changes as progress, and so, if everything had to be if everything had to be paused in order to convince Anita Bryant then the progress would not have happened and now that's a very fair point what happens in a democracy of course is that the group a majority in the group decide the rules for the arena in which the majority are living and you can hear Elon Musk say similar things in the video I did yesterday because gay activists didn't need to persuade Anita Bryant, 
they needed to defeat her. Ah, but, 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 what do you mean defeat her? Defeat her politically. They needed to persuade a certain amount of other people about this issue. Now, I want to bring in another video that the algorithm, the AI algorithm, so nicely popped up, which is a channel that I, I watch fairly infrequently, but it's another YouTube philosophy channel. This is from the YouTube channel Plastic Pills, which is by no means as large as ContraPoints, but, um, and I've, I've watched a few things, but obviously uh, the algorithm and its sort of low resolution, what will Vander Clay watch now, uh, picked this. And it's sort of along the lines of, 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 a lot of what vocal distance was talking about in terms of postmodernity. The spectacle theory assumes that if we communicated about reality better, if we communicated more about the real relations of production, if we wrote more books and made more YouTube videos and then did more public art, then the people would wake up. They'd become conscious. No. Ah, there's the language. If, and you know, this is behind YouTube in many ways, the producing of many videos um, to change your mind, even if I as a minister have learned quite well that the truth is all this talky, 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 talky really doesn't do that much colonization. In fact, most of the talky, talky, talky I do on my channel is really for me. And it's not really for you as if as much as it gives me a chance to sort of speak out loud. Now, I could make these videos and keep them to myself. And every now and then I do make a video and I keep it to myself, just like I used to blog and nobody would read it. But I just found the process of blogging to help me sort of clarify my thoughts. And in, to the degree that insight is pleasurable to have, well, I had pleasure. And along the way, I, I discovered to my surprise and to my delight that if I would talk into this strange machine and post it in a public place, uh, a good number of you would listen and you would talk back and we could have conversations together and these conversations would be interesting. And this is what we're doing again and again and again. But there's a skepticism as to whether or not the sheer volume of the material going out actually makes a difference in the rising of, here's this word, consciousness. Now, this is one of the one of the things going through my mind at the Thunder Bay conference, because on one hand, we like to talk about consciousness as this distinct thing that maybe human beings have and maybe animals have it to lesser degree, and we speculate as to whether um, there's other consciousness out there in the world, if these spirits have consciousness. We had a lot of those conversations. I, I talked about that with John Verveke. But then there's this other use of the word, which is obviously sort of a collective consciousness. And and most of these conscious, these definitions of consciousness have in the back of our minds a, a, little, a little narrative, a little picture story where, well, if consciousness is raised, then everybody will blank. That might mean no longer be racist or no longer be transphobic or no longer abuse the environment or no longer vote for one party or another or... Um, treat people the way they want to be treated. That this idea that this this consciousness raising is somehow salvific for the human race, and that if consciousness is raised, then suddenly people are going to stop doing bad things and start doing good things. And I think it's fairly easy, on one hand, to look at this consciousness raising idea and say, yeah, I can I can look at certain themes in Christian eschatology and sort of connect the dots to that, but it's for, for the most part become disconnected from it and it's sort of become a new age meme. Now, um, what um, what Plastic Pills is doing in, ter in terms of Baudrillard is saying, and I'm sure I'm butchering that name, uh, <laughs> it doesn't work. Oh, says Baudrillard. The problem is not that we don't communicate enough or well enough. It's that we communicate, communicate, communicate way too much already. That medium is the message thing. And the medium itself is antisocial. So sending out more messages 
is not gonna wake people up out of their ideological dream. It merely adds to the complexity of the dream. So if you do- Now, why make videos about the podcast that you were on that now suddenly it didn't turn out the way that you'd like? Well, sort of a vanity project. One of the interesting things about ContraPoints is the pace of videos has basically reduced to a crawl. Hunger was the last video that was 10 months ago. Envy, a video that I covered, 5.1 million views, quite successful, was a year ago. JK Rowling's was two years ago. Then you have two years ago, two years ago, two years ago, two years ago, three years ago. So uh, the pace of videos has, um, yeah, never made a lot of them, but really slowed down. You get the feeling correctly, that social media feels anti-social, then you might be feeling the same thing he did, although he said it way back in the 80s, that time that we look back on as a nostalgic time of neighborhood bike rides and in-person board games. So the way out of the spectacle- Yeah, a lot of that nostalgia depends on how old you were when, when that period was. It's supposed to be more radical production of theory, of situations and art. And here's my response to myself with the benefit of hindsight. You can overproduce as frantically as you want. You can make all the Marxist YouTube videos you want, but in the end, you're just going to be doing the same shit as everyone else. Nothing escapes spectacularization, even protests, and most demonstrably art. In the age of uh, ancient Rome and, and green the around neo-Marxist view of the world, especially history. And if you want a word for what he's doing around the 80s, maybe, maybe call it post-Marxism. So the quick review is that for De Boer, there's an economic base where the real stuff in society happens, especially- I, I really like how he, he really illustrates this well. Commodity ownership, production, and also like power. And then there's a spectacle and the spectacle's not truly productive, it's pseudo productive. Energy sucking choices and fake conflicts, that's spectacle. Images by which we relate to each other that make no difference to the conditions of life. And then between the base and the spectacle are all the people that constitute society. They're all in between. And the spectacle is over here. They're looking this way instead of this way. And they are atomized, alienated in private shells. Why? Now, now this is, of course, the Marxist interpretation moving towards the postmodern interpretation. Now, again, Jordan Peterson with his bloody neo-Marxist Peterson, of course, and James Lindsay and many others have noted that there's been sort of a merger in terms of these two things. But... Well, let's let him finish and then let's talk a little bit more about ContraPoints. Because they're ignorant and stupid. <laughs> so to be conscious is to look this way, to see the truth of the structure, a truth that is in the last instance, at least economic relation. Okay, and that's, there's the Marxism. There's that, well, it's, it's, we're just a product of the economics. And in many ways, Dostoevsky addressed this with notes from the underground that in fact if you and we've seen this again and again if you satisfy the people in terms of their most basic needs um, this communist utopia in fact does not arise and the frustration of real communists during the 20th century was that in fact uh, people were fleeing communism to go to the West for the material conditions that communism itself failed to produce for the people. In other words, uh, yeah, people really are interested in their material conditions, but only to a point. And after a certain point of affluence, people sort of, in a very upper register way, look to the spectacle, and as long as the body is sated, the mind looks to continue to be satisfied with one thing or another, uh, whether that be an experience of meaning or that be an experience of, of, of delight or novelty. And so what happened was the material conditions were satisfied and we just sort of went off into the spectacle. Now, where on earth would you place the whole ContraPoints 
the whole ContraPoints narrative in this because, well, there are bigots down there amidst... Oh, I haven't changed the camera. There are bigots down there amidst these little people. And, well, material conditions, especially with the transgender controversy, that whole material conditions thing really becomes sort of the crux of the matter. And it's the source of a whole lot of the conflict around the T over the LGB patients. So this is what good intellectuals are supposed to do. They wake people up, they give them consciousness, they make them aware of what's really going on. And you see this all the time. Well, you have to, if you really want to know how to be happy, just get more money, even though I mean, all of the studies tend to suggest that after a certain amount of money, the money doesn't really make you that much more happy. And in fact, well, depending on your worldview, um, Jonathan Haidt calls it the cortical lottery. Basically, a lot of the things that are that you can't change don't make you a lot more happy. There's meaning that you can have. And in fact, people will... People will pursue things out of meaning, and it might be material condition, but the real thing that they are pursuing is meaning. The relations of production are still awaiting some social subjects to wake up and move history forward. Now, this is an extremely tense moment. We have our little model. We have all of our people with wills. They have the manpower required to change society, and at long last, are they going to look the right way? What will happen? What are they going to do? Look around. No one's waking up. Oh shit, now they're all falling into fascism. Oh god, oh shit. Why? If theory's supposed to do anything, it needs to figure out why this step doesn't go as planned. Believing in the consciousness of the masses as inevitable or even possible might just be another layer of enlightenment fantasy that humanists are trying to sneak into the model. Of course, consciousness is probably there because it makes theorists feel like they're really important to this process when in fact, the whole model is wrong. And why would that be? It's wrong because it holds that society, the direction of a society, the history of a society is ultimately a matter of decision. If not an actual choice that has been made, then at least a potential choice that we can theorize about making or having been made. A virtual choice. To be unconscious for De Boer is at least the kind of implied choice that the subjects of a society make. They want to continue being unconscious because they're ignorant. They're, be they're beholden to the little uh, pleasures of the spectacle. And so they choose to make fake choices instead of the real choices. So if we ask- Because of course, real in his term means a particular thing. Ask Baudrillard his opinion on the matter. If we look around a bit, you know, we have maybe 10,000 years of cultures and not many of them were really that concerned with this fantastic event of the choice. Is that because they were all stupid and ignorant? Or is it more accurate to say that choices more often choose them and they were a lot more concerned with rituals and simulacra and images than the rather boring question of who owns what in fact when it comes to that question they're not really ignorant at all people usually know exactly who owns what and don't care and as often as not they end up worshiping those owners and the reason they do that a marxist may theorize is that they are all beholden to ideology or false consciousness. And I should specify, this is not all Marxists, just the representationalist ones or the humanist ones, like De Boer. He still hopes that society is at bottom a matter of freedom, a social contract. And because of that damned spectacle, we the people choose not to be free. Well, of course, and it's also because of, well, if your non-communist society is outperforming in terms of the stuff that you say should make you happy, which is stuff, well, your little communist utopia is just out of luck. 
So Baudrillard asks instead, what if we aren't trapped by ideology? What if they are actually, and we are actually, getting exactly what we want from the TVs and the TikToks, whether that's consuming football or consuming educational content on YouTube? What if it's the theorists who are alienated from the masses? Theorists who give all these explanations for our behavior after the fact, without understanding us at all? What if deep down, we really don't want the burden of anything like freedom? Big if true. So here, I guess, is like the, the summary overview. The spectacle theory, whatever it's good for, and it's good for a lot, it's fun, but it's cooking with the wrong ingredients insofar as consciousness and freedom are part of the explanatory recipe. Because Baudrillard's post-Marxism isn't dumping all of Marxism. He wants to test out some alternative hypotheses, like whatever event of consciousness you're supposing could happen, it's not happening. It's never happened. And it's not not happening because everyone is stupid and watches Fox News instead of reading uh, the Communist Manifesto. And this is for sure true that consciousness is a really terrible as a supposed reactant in revolutions. You know what's a good necessary cause? Starvation. This goes out to anyone who has ever typed the words overthrow capitalism into their phone or computer, okay? Has there ever been a revolution without starvation? Because when they're fed, the masses don't do anything unexpected. So instead of just taking the route of calling them stupid or saying they're all deceived, Baudrillard's not interested in calling them subjects at all. Let's not even call them objects. Let's just group them as a giant aggregate mass object. Now, individuals might have inconsequential disagreements with each other, but the mass as a whole exists to keep everything in politics moving in the same direction. Definitely not to change direction. And the only time the masses ever wake up to change direction is when they're starving. This might be controversial, I don't know. It doesn't seem like that to me. There has never in history been a revolution caused by ideas, no matter what. Now, ContraPoints, of course, has seen progress. And progress has been done, but the question is, has the progress been done because of some change of consciousness? Or is it, in fact, that, for the most part, people sort of looked around and said, the more affluent we are, the more we can afford to let people sort of do what they want. Um, the more we can, we're not going to worry, well, this might very well change as the narrative goes from overpopulation to underpopulation and population collapse. That might completely, completely undermine any of this sec this uh, reproductive less sexual revolution that we've been having not that people don't enjoy reproduction free sex but the point might actually turn to reproduction and then you also have the fact that um, chances are good because unless um, unless the the state has a plan to really stop the first drafting of children from their parents as increasingly people either from a traditional perspective or from a religious perspective continue to be the ones bringing children into the world, those who have decided that um, they are not going to participate in biological reproduction of the species and in the benevolent, careful raising of the next generation are going to continue to find themselves completely at the behest of all the tools that they have to propagandize future generations. In other words, all you need to do with Anita Bryant is to defeat her, but really, are the likes of Anita Bryant really going to go away when Anita Bryant is a mo mother of four? Now, ContraPoints will make the point that Anita Bryant had a granddaughter who didn't invite her to her lesbian wedding, but 
the rest of the kids are still running around and they might rather blithely if all of their material needs are met and if the people around them are not being inconvenienced too much they might say so what let the let the people do what they want as long as it doesn't bother me or get in my way but there's a real issue when it comes to people and their sensitivities and children and that's what they did. We have to accept that realistically, persuading all the bigots is just not an option. Yes, we should convince as many people as possible, but there will always be bigots. And mocking them, shaming them, or boycotting them is, I think, a perfectly valid strategy. But strategy for what? Because it's not a strategy. She's already declared that the bigots will be convinced it's a strategy for keeping other people in the spectrum from sounding and manifesting like bigots. But the difficulty for that is they vote in secret. And in some ways, part of this is what's been happening in the Christian Reformed Church because people, for the most part, go along to get along, we'll do this, we'll do that, but then suddenly when things change, hmm, they didn't all go along with what we thought the March of Progress should be. Well, why not? Well, it turns that this shaming strategy might be sort of a good short-term strategy for sort of disincentivizing people with a certain amount of bigotry in them to manifest that bigotry what you're probably doing is just sort of putting a lid on it until it boils over. And you would think that a group that had been closeted for a very long time might be able to understand that sort of dynamic. Does that mean that when we cancel bigots, we're acting kind of like the Westboro Baptist Church? Nar. You would only think that if you're a total moral relativist. I guess controversial opinion, but bigotry is shameful, and it should be shamed. Um. I'll say it. You know, if you're testing... Okay, why? Is it shamed for a political end? And it, But again, I would argue that shaming, if, if your politics require continual vigilance, that vigilance comes at a cost. Persuasion and agreement at a much more fundamental level, and not one that is simply sort of a cheap libertarian move, which says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let my neighbor do what my neighbor wants as long as it doesn't seem to bother me. Go ahead. But the moment it begins to cost me something, hmm, I'm going to think about it some more. You know, if you're testing out some racist ideas in your head, you might feel afraid to express them publicly for fear of being shamed or judged. But what then do you wind up doing? Do the racist ideas go away? Do the bigoted ideas go away? Isn't, in fact, the long-term goal, shouldn't the long-term goal be if you actually want to change society instead of just having a winning party that perpetually has to keep a lid on the other side, is in fact try to change them from the inside out. I would argue, of course, that this is in fact the Christian way, and in, in fact the best Christian way, because generally speaking, when Christians try to choose the other way, long term it doesn't go well. Is that because we live in an Orwellian dystopia that punishes people for wrong think? No, it's because racism is dangerous and shameful, and you should be ashamed of it, and the people judging you are right to do so. And sure, there are some very patient people who devote their lives to de-radicalizing bigots, which I think is a perfectly noble thing to do. There's a guy named Daryl Davis who's befriended members of the Ku Klux Klan for over 30 years, and he claims he's convinced more than 200 of them to leave. And good for him. De-radicalization is a valid strategy, but it cannot be the only strategy, and it must not be the primary strategy. Because we're not going to defeat race- But again, the primary strategy for what? And now she goes back to the defeat word. Racism by telling black people to be a little nicer to racists. How, in fact, was racism dramatically 
reduced in the United States, she would have to look at the civil rights movement. And there are many aspects to the civil rights movement, but if you want to ask, well, how can, in fact, some of some bigoted ideas be reduced, generally speaking, the way is, well, actually have better conversations, actually have people getting to know each other. Now, that does not mean someone's necessarily going to come and see it your way. And I think this is one of the things that we've seen in many places in the entire LGBTQ conversation, because in many ways, the this movement has changed people's opinions to a degree. They might no longer want to yell hateful things. They might be more open to more acceptance and toleration. There might be a realization that certain means of control are actually no longer effective and are counterproductive. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are along for a program, and part of the difficulty of all of this is where, in fact, does this program go? And the question of where it goes has a lot to do with the much more foundational questions of, well, where does bigotry come from? Where do all of these other ideas come from? To what degree are they formed? To what degree, why do they arise? And despite all of the focus that has gone on in the last 20 years over these issues, what's interesting is that a lot of the really serious questions about source for behaviors, really there's less political appetite or tolerance for studying those, lest certain dogmas, I will call them polit um, progressive liberationist dogmas, get triggered. So we've talked about this very much sort of echoes the winsome war. We've talked about the lack of serious conversation about the dynamics of, well, what is a bigot? Where does it come from? What can happen with bigots? What is this fight really about? And I think the last thing I want to touch on, because I don't want this video to be too long, is again, what I have often called progressive liberationism. Rowling seems to think that the trans rights movement is dangerous and authoritarian in some unprecedented way that makes it different from all past liberation movements. Ah, uh, now we have the narrative. We have past liberation movements and the overall eschatological project is progressive liberation from one thing to another. The difficulty, of course, is, well, when you look at human beings and the amount of grievances that they can definitely come up with, and these grievances get increasingly lodged in the range of the spectacle as these things go, well, at what point do does can you actually just continue to liberate ourselves away from anyone's suffering? And in fact, what does that look like? Or do we just simply all get lost in viewing the spectacle? But how? What are these illiberal methods that distinguish trans rights activism from similar past movements? Canceling? Anita Bryant was way more canceled than JK Rowling ever will be. Boycotts? Boycotts have been a staple of every progressive movement in modern history. Disrupting feminist meetings? Disrupting feminist meetings is a feminist tradition. Haven't you heard of the Lavender Menace? In 1969, Betty Friedan, author of The Feminine Mystique and founder of the National Organization for Women and Second Wave Feminism in general, coined the phrase Lavender Menace to describe the threat she believed that lesbians posed to the women's movement. Friedan was worried that being associated with lesbians would make it easy to dismiss the movement as a bunch of mannish man-haters. This understandably pissed off a bunch of lesbians who attended the Second Congress to Unite Women in 1970 to stage what used to be known as a ZAP, a disruptive public protest designed to draw attention to gay rights issues. Now, you could see the way the argument goes. The question is always, okay, is this 
eschatological project simply a great tease? Now, this obviously is a something that is put onto Christianity often. Well, waiting for Godot, waiting for Jesus to come back. It's just a big tease. Well, is this not also a big tease? And so basically her argument is that she's much more the vanguard than some of the the TERFs and the women and the lesbians now that are there before. Okay, well, what does that mean? Are all of these people just bigots? The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, Megan interviews New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg, who has written sympathetically about transphobic feminism. There's a moment in this interview where Michelle kind of stumbles into an honest observation that I find fascinating. Right, I mean, I think you'll often hear people say, you know, I'm not going to debate my basic humanity. And, and part of the difficulty is that there are indeed certain issues which we have sort of decided somewhat collectively with some sort of consensus are beyond the realm of, of debate. And I think that part of what is so difficult about this issue is that there are certain people who think that this kind of consensus can be imposed maybe as opposed to evolve organically. And so they're sort of desperately trying to shore it up in the hopes, I think, that if they can they will enjoy the same sort of assumed protection as other groups whose rights we've decided are not up for public conversation. I think the problem is that we don't actually have a consensus. So Michelle correctly observes that the reason trans people are often reluctant to debate our rights is that we want the same assumed protections as other groups whose rights liberals have decided are not up for debate. But and I think ContraPoints makes an extremely fair point here that well, you know, it's sort of like the, the, the person who gets into the United States and says, okay, no more immigrants after me. And, well, is that fair? The problem, of course, is that if you don't actually have a structure that this whole system is either moving towards or moving around, if you don't actually have something more like a fixed ideal, you're just always going to have the, you're just always going to have these, continual revolutions, one overturning another. And it's really a nice narrative to imagine that this has all simply been a straight line without looking at many of the revolutions that haven't happened. You know, it's, it's helpful to remember that the progressive movement has been around for a long time and eugenics was certainly a part of this movement, as was prohibition. And now you can very fairly argue that, well, these things have been tried and, and put away. What that means, however, is you don't know what things you're trying now that won't be put away. Now, maybe in some grand progress, this is all part of the evolution of us knowing, but we also tend to be have fairly short memories and we've forgotten the projects that didn't work in the past. And so we just tend to wind up chasing our tail. Basically, she then goes to a sort of a purity argument. Waiting other people not to listen to them. And it's also worth cautioning that de-radicalization is often a messy and incomplete process. 20-year-old white nationalist Peter Saitanovic became the face of the fascist Unite the Right rally in 2017 when a photo of him mid-scream, tiki torch in hand, was published in news outlets all over the country. Peter was unrepentant in interviews he gave immediately after the rally, but he began to question his beliefs after befriending a Muslim woman who, according to Charlotte McDonald Gibson, challenged his views without insulting him, allowing him to understand the hurt he had caused. Peter is no longer a white nationalist, but that doesn't mean he's flushed out every trace of bigotry. Oh, that's the... So can this be flushed? And again, there's no understanding of where exactly does this bigotry come from? In a 2019 interview with the London School of Economics student paper, Peter said, I don't like the whole transgender thing. You're born either a man or a woman. <sighs> So he maybe still has a little bit of work to do. When I did de-radicalization work on YouTube, I used to get some criticism from people of color who were not thrilled that I was bringing a bunch of semi-reformed racists over to the left. A frustration that I totally understand. To paraphrase YouTube- Semi-reformed racists. So in other words, well, 
what what are in fact are you going to do with all of these semi-reformed racists? At, at what point are they um, not? Or is racism totally purged from their hearts? Now remember, I'm a Calvinist. Um, we all have a huge complement of sin within us. Hopefully, most of it not um, not reaching what we think, re reaching the maximum of what it could be. Super Ian Danskin, diverse leftist communities are maybe not the best holding space for someone who's a bit of a Nazi but working on it. In the case of Megan Phelps Roper, I don't know if she has lingering bigoted sentiments, but what she does have is a kind of hypervigilant skepticism about anything she perceives as ideology. This is pretty common with people who used to be religious fundamentalists. They were. So I want to go back to this this phrase, which I think is really so helpful. So I don't know. Whose diverse leftist communities are maybe not the best holding space for someone who's a bit of a Nazi but working on it. In the case of Megan Phelps Roper, I don't know if she has lingering bigoted sentiments. So in other words, now we're going to have to keep an eye on each other. See. Well, you, you seem to have left your bigoted ideas, but how far really have they gone from you? We're not quite sure to what degree we will let you be a part of this. And now suddenly we have this whole closeting, hiding, self-suspicion. You know, what they're, what they're setting up here, well, where's all this stuff, where's all this stuff going to go? But what she does have is a kind of hypervigilant skepticism about anything she perceives as ideology. This is pretty common with people who used to be religious fundamentalists. Well, that's a generalization. What exactly is bigotry again? They were so certain they were right, only to realize that everything they believed about the world is wrong. So they become distrustful of any strong moral convictions, because it reminds them of their former fanaticism. Coming so in other words, we have some strong moral convictions that are at the center of what we think it means to be a good person, and we're going to judge others, and we're going to use a word like bigot to decide whether or not they can actually have that strong moral conviction like we have. Right there is the winsome war all over again. Anyway, I think that's enough of this. Um, I'll leave it up to you if you want to watch it. It is classic ContraPoints. Uh, I've watched it twice. Um, I, I always learn stuff from ContraPoints, and I don't find her videos unenjoyable. But, um, yeah, it is exactly what it is. So... Let me know what you think. Leave a comment.